All right, I've got Mr. David Zapata here with us today. And David, we are going to be having a conversation around developing an uncommon savings strategy. Let's dive into this. So when it comes to the key components of wealth building, this wealth foundation is a piece that nobody gets to bypass. If you want to go to the top and build massive wealth, whether you're making $100 million a year or $100,000 a year, you do not get to the top without building the proper foundation. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the size of your pyramid is probably directly correlated to the strength and um, size of your foundation, just like it makes sense for a home or a building, right? And one of the things that I love uh, to hear about when we talk about this conversation is that it applies to, like you said, you, me, or a person that's making $100 million a month. It does not matter. This part, foundational, is a question of scale, not a question of, of, of if, but it's a question of how can I put an intentional place in every single one of these buckets? Because you may already have a default plan that is not exactly what you want. Absolutely. And notice the first segment on our pyramid, David, is financial education. Mm -hmm. This is why we teach to educate. All This is why we have our courses. This is why we teach our seminars, because we always have to be investing into our financial education. The higher that becomes, the more likelihood that you're going to build something truly massive, truly unique. And going back to one of Nelson's principles, we never succumb to the arrival syndrome. Yeah. We're always looking to constantly learn, which is why it's at the first piece of this pyramid. Now, next is financial awareness. Once we start on this journey of wealth building, it's important for us to be aware of our surroundings and our environment, right? I've heard you relate this to, you need to have a relationship with your financial statements. Yeah. Tell us about that. I, I think this is a very important uh, concept, you know, like financial education, financial awareness, to me, speak to the mindset. It is very difficult to become a person capable of engaging in a wealth building process without having the right ideas between your ears, right? And these two things is absorbing that uh, example of success from whatever we can get and to know what to do. When we know what's happening, we know what to do. Financial awareness is then reflected in that information in the education to how it looks to my life internally. I think that the best um, way to keep a contact sport in finances is to have a financial statement where you clearly understand what's happening with your income, sta income statement. What are your income uh, sources? What are your expenses? What do they look like? And then go to a balance sheet and understand, okay, on a monthly basis at a minimum, I have a relationship where I go and take a look at my assets and my liabilities. I understand my net worth. This is what we are observing in the pros, right? At the highest levels, we're observing that these people understand their numbers, and not just for their businesses, but how it reflects in their family, how it reflects in whoever they interact as a partner. And I think the other side of financial awareness that is really important, once you understand yourself and you have that self-reliance in your own financials, you can then contrast to what's happening around you because that's the other part of awareness that is important. You need to put this in a context of what's happening locally in your economy, what's happening in the national and global economy. What are the trends that you see in a, in a particular business industry? That is uh, how you position yourself with the right ideas. And you then, again, to go back to Nelson, when you know what's happening, you know what to do. Absolutely. And two things I want to add to that is, Earlier in the video series, you saw the five circles conversation. What we believe is if you want to wake up and enjoy every second of every moment and you're truly living your max potential, you have to create abundance in those five circles. And what's the most important thing in each one of those circles is the relationship. Yeah. Well, if you want to go to the top, let's say you want to go to a certain destination. It's very far away. We would look up a, a GPS system, right, yeah. to track where we're at and where we're going. So part of this journey has to be, you have to understand where you're at right now. And if you want to go over here, then you start to plot that course. But having the relationship with your financial statement, like you said, monthly, a lot of people maybe test this once a year, quarterly. It's got to be a monthly thing. Imagine having a relationship with your spouse and you only saw them once a quarter. Yeah, That's probably not going to be a great marriage. You probably need to see them on a consistent basis. So you need to develop this type of relationship with your financial statement. You gotta be aware of where money's coming in, where it's going out. And so, which is why we put it at the foundation of this, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, the last piece of this foundation is the savings strategy. We know Americans uh, are not saving enough money. And so we live in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. 
Let's talk about this a little bit and why we need to develop a stronger saving strategy and why that piece is so vital to the foundation. Let's do it. So let's talk about common and uncommon income levels. Now, when we share this um, in a live setting, we like to get interaction from people and it's always fascinating to see the different guesses where people are at, right? Now, to be in the top 50% income earners in the US, now this is household income split point, uh, you have to make $41,740. That's to be a the, shocking number for most people, by the way. To be in the top 50%. Top 25%, you need to be making about $83,000. Top 10, 145. Top 5% is 208,000. And to be in the top 1% of income earners in the US, $515,000. Yep. Now this range when we're doing this live is all over the room, right? Yeah. 2 million, 3 million. Most people don't know that these numbers are actually this low, Yeah. right? Now, if, if you're looking at these levels, and, I'm, and we're saying, well, shoot, both of us are making very uncommon income, mm -hmm. well above the top 50%, right? So if we're looking at that, that should tell you a lot. If you're making uncommon income, why are you taking common advice when it comes to your money, so specifically around savings, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to be careful what kind of information we're letting flow into our lives. If we're making uncommon income, we should be doing what the uncommon folk are doing. I, I, this go back, this goes back to me to when you know what's happened, you know what to do. And to me, <clears throat> it takes a different path, but like one realization for me is that my prom is not an income prom and I need to put at the foundation of my financial journey, gratitude. I am living in an incredible set of opportunities to create abundance for my family and for my community in general, as a matter of fact. And most people that sit through this exercise end up, end up concluding the same. Wow, 50% of Americans live with less than 40,000 as a household income. Mm -hmm. So whether you make 100, 200, a million, ten, it doesn't matter. The opportunity for you to thrive while building wealth is here. And that is the differentiation between having lots of income and then taking the next intentional step, which is setting an intentional saving strategy, which I think you're going to talk to. Key word there is intentional. Yes. If you want to build wealth, you have to get intentional. Absolutely. And so we know we're extremely blessed to live in this country because the opportunity is endless. Like you said, income is not our problem, right? You look at this and the savings rate across America is still very low compared to other countries. There, we do not have an income problem. Now, we are also, uh, we subscribe to the go-giver mentality. We live to educate. We live to give. A big part of our community and culture that we're building is founded on giving. Um, this is one of the most fulfilling parts of the wealth building journey is not so much what you're making and keeping, but how much you're able to give, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's look at one more stat. The, to be in the top 1% income earners in across the globe worldwide, you got to be making a little over $34,000. Yeah, it's shocking. It's shocking. Like that, talk about perspective, right? Like we're talking na nationwide in the US, largest, you know, Production, productive economy in the world. Of course, you know, these numbers, even though we might be a little off, make sense. But once you go and zoom out to the entire population of the world and you see $34,000 put you at the 1%, then the question immediately gets answered. The opportunity that we have is exactly what we need. Everything we need is here for us to intentionally build wealth and it's a matter of, again, developing the right education, the right awareness, and then building them the pyramid, as we are going to talk, foundation uh, to succeed. Right. And going back to, let's just talk about the family circle real quick. You know, looking at these stats is one of the reasons why when my boys are old enough, we're going to take them down to Honduras, where one of our, our fact and wealth strategists has been doing charity there for almost 30 years. Yeah. And they build homes for a, a village in Honduras. Now, if you go down there with incomes like this, this is when the perspective sets into place and you say, oh my gosh, yeah. we are so blessed to live in the United States. And so to give my boys some perspective on where they're coming from versus where a lot of how a lot of the other uh, parts of the world live, uh, I think is very important for that, that abundance in the five circles. Yeah. Going back to gratitude, right? We are so blessed to be in this country with the resources and opportunity that we have. Yeah. My, my my family and I talk about a very simple phrase that orients our relationship with money in our financial circle. And it's, we love people and use money, not the other way around. Mm. We don't love money and use people. We use money, but we love people first. 
And that clarifies to us every decision we make that yes, money is the opportunity to be more comfortable where we are and create more abundance is wonderful. But it also serves the purpose to impact everyone around me or even those beyond my physical presence to make their lives better. And that is part of an intentional wealth building when you want to create more meaning to your life. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. All right. <clears throat> we talked about common versus uncommon income. So now let's talk about savings rates. So how much do you have to be saving um, to be common? Now, what are we looking at right here, David? This is uh, data from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. And this is a chart from uh, the turn of the 21st century. So January 2000. And we're looking at the personal savings rate, which the Federal Reserve qualifies as personal income minus taxes and expenses. That's the simplest way they calculate this number. And we're looking in the blue line across time from 2000 all the way to January 2023, what that rate was across the country. And the shocking part for us when we review this data is that for the longest time through multiple recessions, that rate is very low. And in January of 2023, that rate was 4.7 most recently. So when, when I look at this, what makes me think, we, we trace a red line across the screen here for the 5%. It, it is that in average in America, people are used to, in a long period of time, to save around 5% of their income, right? That is common savings rate. Right. Right. So we live in a place where we're so abundantly blessed to have the income levels that we do with all that wealth that is flowing through our hands. As Americans, we save less than 5% of it. Yeah. This is a huge part of the problem that we're seeing. And this is also why, you know, during COVID, we saw so many businesses go under because if you don't have enough savings on hand, why could they not float themselves? Income's not their problem. It was a savings conversation. And this is why we put this conversation at the base of this pyramid, because it doesn't matter if you're scaling to an enormous, uh, you know, size of wealth, if you don't have the proper foundation in place, you're, suscept you're susceptible to loss if yeah. you don't have a good straight saving strategy in place. What good was 10 years of enormous returns in your business if COVID came along and you didn't have control of it and it wiped you out because you didn't have a sufficient savings plan? And this is why we, we talk about this early on, yeah. right? And so less than 5%, it, it, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. And, and another thing I love to point out, and the reason why we did the series a little extended is, we're also talking about a period after the financial crisis where we had the largest bull market in history of the United States. It's mm -hmm. a time of prosperity is what we would call that, right? And you do not see a meaningful effect on the, on the trend on the personal savings throughout 2010 all the way to the COVID crisis, right? And then you see a couple of spikes here, which are really interesting too. You know, and this will be my personal experience. I think you share it too. It's obviously up for, for uh, different discussion, but... What I find fascinating is that the major spikes that we see in 2021, 2022 correlate to when Americans receive stimulus checks, right? These are government stimulus to the economy that create a huge spike. People will save that because there's fear or because there's an extra addition of money. And then those come crashing down as they stimulate the spending to the effect that at the end of 2022, in the middle of 2022, the savings rate drops below mm -hmm. below 5%. And we've talked about this. The effect of having that additional money in people's hands created the inflation we're living through today. And the effects on that is that then we actually pay the price by having even less to save. Right. It's a, a fascinating conversation. One of the missions that we're on here at Factum is this is why we focus so much on the foundation. Yeah. We have foundational problems in our country. And one of them is the savings rate. We've got to be addressing this, which is why we, we coach people on save more money yeah. and then also change that savings environment. Yeah. So let's look at this. So if you want to be common, you should be saving about 5% of your income. Yeah. Now on the previous slide, if we're making uncommon income, we should also be telling ourselves we should be saving uncommon amounts of money. I don't want to be common. If yeah. you want to get common results, you do what common people do. So if you're making uncommon amounts of money, we would recommend you save uncommon amounts of money, somewhere in the 10 to 30% ratio. Now that 10% number, any financial book you read, Total Money Makeover, Tony Robbins, Dave Ramsey, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Richest Man in Babylon, any of them, they're going to tell you, pay yourself first, put something aside, it's always 10%. Mm -hmm. So 10% to me has to be the minimum. Yeah. Now, if you want to be well above common, which we both are, 
we're saving significantly more than that. Why? I have plans to scale my wealth to an unbelievable amount, which means I've got to have a very strong foundation in place. It's the same conversation you brought up earlier. You want to build a house, the first thing you got to do is lay your foundation. Well, if you want to build a skyscraper, you still got to lay the foundation, but it's got to be deeper and it's got to be reinforced. I can't afford to save 10% of my income. It's not enough for what I want to do. I have to save in the 30s, if not higher, because I want to stay protected. There's... And, and, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but like I, I love that you're now digging deeper into an idea that comes from a very simple origin. You know, you've talked early in a previous video about the problem we're trying to solve for your need for financing. If you keep using third parties for financing, they're going to benefit from dollars that you should be retaining as benefit for your family, your business. Same idea with this. If you want to scale to have wealth that is uncommon, guess what your number one need is going to be? Financing. And financing comes right there from avoiding the third party by having capital formation, by having money available to you when you can access and that you can control. That simple idea, again, Mm -hmm. I heard that so many times, Kyle, and I let it go past one ear and go out the other. And the more I process that in between my ears, the more profound I find the idea that uh, in one of our uh, seminars, they came up for every reason I have to invest, there's a greater reason to create capital first. That is the foundation, again, that we're talking about in that bottom layer, putting yourself in a position to take advantage of opportunity or protect yourself against risk by having money available to you within your control. Love it. Which is why we we have this conversation mm -hmm. first and foremost as the foundation. Yeah. Now, let's move ahead. So common versus uncommon savings environments. See, this is what makes this conversation we're having so unique. Mm -hmm. Most of the world, if not every other wealth seminar course that you'll be on, will say, you know, gauge how much you're making and then save a portion of it conversation ends and right there. This is where our conversation begins and it's why this conversation we're having is so unique. Why is no one talking about the savings environment that you've created for yourself? Yeah. This is such a game changer when you take the time to just stop and focus on this. You know, the environment that you have in your life uh, is critical to your success or failure. Having the right home environment, is that imperative to having a good family life versus a poor? Yeah. Absolutely. What about um, the environment in which resources are available to you? Let's say America versus maybe a third world country. That environment is critical, right? Sure. So when we're talking about savings, I want to make sure that our savings are in an environment that is conducive to massive success. Yeah. But we have to go to the uncommon again, right? So let's talk about this. Where should your savings reside? Once you have established that I'm making uncommon amounts of income, and then I'm going to build the habit of saving uncommon amounts of money. Now the question is, where do you keep that savings? Yeah. Now, most people are saving where, David? Yeah, I, it, it's amazing because in this question, in a common way of thinking, it only has one answer. Institutions with buildings in a corner of a major city that are beautiful and have polished floors. I call this the four amigos. That's just how I think about it. But you can think <laughs> of any major bank in the country, right? And the reason they're so immediate to thought when you ask yourself, what's the environment in which I save my money is because, hey, they're in every corner. That is so convenient. I have liquidity because I can go and access money quickly. It's perceived as being safe. You know, if they're going to rob them, they're going to rob them. But it's probably safer than my house on, under my mattress, right? They've placed themselves at the at the forefront of my of my thought when I think about this. Mm -hmm. They've been very effective at it. Isn't that interesting, right? Yeah. So when we think of savings environments, most people almost immediately banks. I oh, save in the bank. Absolutely. Why? Because that's the way we've been programmed to think. You, you nailed it right on the head. These big banks, the four amigos as you <laughs> refer to them, they want you programmed that way because it makes them insanely wealthy. Absolutely. Now, this is one of the reasons why we teach what we teach, and our slogan is beat the banks. We want to show you how to save where the uncommon people are saving, and then how to move your money the same way a bank does. Now, banks, it's, it's no mystery that they're some of the best players in the money game. Absolutely. So why don't we go study them? Why don't we go learn about them, where they save, how they move money? And what you'd find if you'll do that is they treat their money the exact opposite way that most middle Americans treat theirs. Absolutely. Strange coincidence? I don't know. So let's talk about some common versus 
uncommon savings environments, David. So first, savings account. The most traditional product you immediately think of. If you were to interview 100 people and ask them, is a savings account a common place? Every single person would say yes. We need, we need Steve Harvey here. And that would be answer number one. Yeah. Yes. Answer number one, exactly. Yes. What about checking account? Right there. Very common, right? There. right? Very Everyone's common. got checking accounts, savings accounts. Yep. What about a certificate of deposit, a CD? More traditional. Some people would use it. I don't think it's common anymore. I would yeah. agree. Now, what about cash? Yeah, it's part of the conversation in some culture. You know, you will have pretty opposite views. Cash is trash. You hear that, mm. you know, in an environment of inflation. But some people still may have apprehension to use banks. Will have some cash available. Oh yeah, yeah. I would say cash is very common. People sure. are people are going to have cash one way or another. What about treasury bills? This is an interesting one. It's an interesting one. I don't think this is as common for a majority of people, but more sophisticated people would see this as a way to maintain high liquidity on a high quality asset that they can um, quickly uh, trade for dollars when they need to. So I think it is um, less common, but still a tactic that is identified as a way to use a, as a short-term vehicle for savings. Absolutely. Right. I, I would agree 100%. So yeah. most people aren't that familiar with treasury bills, but Part of some of the elite people that we're working with that are very high net worth, understand cash flow. What they're doing with their treasury treasury bills is they'll go purchase 30, 60, 90 day bills and they roll it over. Roll this over. helps their cash accounts become quite efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so not a bad strategy, but very uncommon. You're not going to hear about that strategy at a, at a common level, right? Yeah. Now, what about whole life insurance? Interesting. This is one of my favorite ones to bring up in a live room because... A lot of the room will be very hesitant to raise their hand. Mm -hmm. But for guys like you and I, we've been studying the banks. We watch what they do, where they save. Whole life insurance for you and I is a very common place for us to save money. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Now, why is that? Because inside an insurance policy contract, what we know is you get so many benefits from keeping your savings in that environment that you are never going to get if you save in common places. Yeah. So most people, most Americans are programmed to save with a bank because it's liquid and it's safe. You can go get access to it if you need it, right? Now we like the policies because you're getting all of these benefits right here. This is a tremendous environment to keep your savings in. Yeah. Now let's dig a little bit deeper on each one of these topics. And before you move on, I love pointing this out when we talk about this to clients. The reason we include that list of uh, descriptions is because we want to point out the fact that the four amigos express themselves about this little contract, whole life insurance, using these descriptions. Hmm. This is not Kyle or David or anybody else making up a list of advantages. This is how banks describe the benefits of owning these contracts, and it is why they put their money there and not with other banks, which has an important distinction. It is. This is this is how they view insurance as part of their wealth foundation, Absolutely. right? So let's uh, let's look at a couple quotes. So here's one that comes from Barry Dyke, the author of The Pirates of Manhattan, mm -hmm. which, in in my opinion, he's done more research and investigation into who's really buying whole life and why, yeah. which are the very uncommon places, big banks, giant corporations, very wealthy families, families and individuals. Mm -hmm. And what he says, this is fascinating, around the year 1900, approximately 50% of people's discretionary savings in America went into permanent life insurance and annuity products. Mm -hmm. See, that's not that long ago, yeah. right? Now here, here you and I, we believe that whole life is a very common place to store money for us now based off what we've seen. And this used to be a very common place for Americans to save money. In a hundred years, they turned that narrative on its head. You know, one out of two Americans in a room that we would be teaching this would be like, of course, that's common. Yes. hundred years later, it is a very uncommon and very hesitant response because the narrative has been changed. So it's amazing to remember, you know, how our great grandparents were preparing to go into the largest recession they saw in their lifetime. Great point. Yeah. And it's, it's why we teach to educate, right? This used to be common information that existed. And it's part of the mission that we're on is to bring this back to middle Americans and yeah. let them know there are more efficient savings environments, whether the banks, Wall Street, giant corporations will tell you that or not, up for debate, right? Yeah. We know what's really happening. Now, here's another quote from uh, President Grover Cleveland. He says, life insurance has to do with the most sacred things that stir the human affections. 
Its management involves a higher duty and a more constant devotion than we associate with a mere business enterprise. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why we're so passionate about insurance, uh, because like what he's saying here is that this is relating to some of the most sacred things that stir the human affections. So life insurance has a protection aspect into it, a generational conversation that goes past just business. This was a higher calling for a lot of these people, you know, 100 plus years ago. They understood the value of this asset class. This is a president talking to its people about moral values and how to live a life in a relationship with their money that affected not just a money conversation, but overall responsibility, duty, uh, you know, the words that he's using, sacred. I mean, mm -hmm. This is a president addressing its population. It's you fascinating. Know, it's fascinating. Here's another one from Theodore Roosevelt. He says, life insurance increases the stability of the business world, raises its moral tone, and puts a premium upon those habits of thrift and saving, which are so essential to the welfare of the people as a body. What does this one mean to you? I mean, it's incredible, right? He's talking about incredible um, components of society, right? Stability of the business world. He understood that it, it had an impact overall in the economy of the country. Raising moral tone. He's talking about putting habits into place for thrift and savings. You know, essential for the welfare of the people as a body. In, integral to the family as the structure of society. Again, this is 80, 1885, then at the turn of the century, Teddy Roosevelt is talking about life insurance like this. It is shocking to me that we've forgotten again where some of these ideas come from, you know? And I, I you know, I'm very passionate about this. I love talking about this. I think in a, in a world full of a narrative where people think of whole life insurance negatively or uh, misunderstand at a minimum the product, I like going back to this because it just speaks to me to the basics of where America was founded, right? Mm -hmm. It's a solution that's very simple. It's you and I and all of us in our community saying, I want to protect your family and my family yeah. against the risk that you died too early. Right. Let's do a private contract. There's no money from government. We are doing a capitalistic free market solution to protect your family and mine from the risk that is 100% going, uh, to, happen. going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. If it happens too early, we'll protect your kids and your wife. And if it's not, we'll continue to build value for all of us. I think there's beauty on that. And remembering that that's where this comes from aligns to me to say, okay, this aligns not only financially, but with my values and with the community I'm trying to build for my kids. So I think it's really, really powerful to read this. It's so powerful. There, there's so much that we can gather and adapt to our lives based off of like you said, our grandparents are great care. Yeah. They knew things that we should have been studying along the way. Somewhere along that path, the education changed, the programming changed, and we saw this type of mentality, right? Yeah. And, and really quick, you know, this date, there was no IRS then. There was mm -hmm. no there was no federal taxation back then, right? We're talking about things that precede yeah. at the core of how the, the community was structured, financial uh, stability was structured before any of these entities we deal with in the modern world were created. Yeah, powerful. Yeah. Here's another one from Franklin Roosevelt. To carry adequate life insurance is a moral obligation incumbent upon the great majority of citizens. So once again, all of these people knew this. They knew it at a high level. They understood the economic value that it brought into our lives. And not only for us individually, but when enough people have that type of asset class, what that does to your family, your community, and eventually across the nation. These are some of the leaders of our country that knew these principles and knew they should be in, um, in that asset class of, of wealth building, right? They understood it. Today, the, the information's, I would say, wildly skewed. Yes. So many misconceptions around what whole life insurance is. Yes. Here's a fascinating stat <laughs> is when he died, uh, in 1945, $562,000 of life insurance was owned by the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation. His net worth, Roosevelt's at that time, was $1.3 million. 43% of his state. 43% of his state was represented in a death benefit from a life insurance policy. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. I, I joke about this, and I, I actually don't mean it as a joke, but like, if you think that he was getting hmm. financial advice as a president, from somebody that is not as good as the financial advice you can get individually, you're kidding yourself. Right. This you're guy's got yourself. access to some of the top minds and strategies the and best. people. 
And here he is, 43% of his net worth was in life insurance. Yeah. If that doesn't tell you a whole story right there. At a minimum, hopefully it poses a question in your mind of why. Yeah. Because when you go after that answer, it will blow your mind. Yeah. You'll, you'll find exactly what these guys yeah. are talking about right here. Yeah. Yeah. I think in this next slide, there's a, a, a contrast to this because now we're talking about, okay, a hundred years ago, it was common for the leaders of our country how people were actually behaving. 50% of the country was saving in that vehicle, right? What happened? What's the narrative? Why has the narrative changed? And we wanted to contrast that thought pattern with the fact that, hey, you know what? In certain circles, in certain groups, the bankers, the corporations, the wealthy, it is still common. They yeah. just kicked a portion of the population, actually 97% of the population out of that conversation. And I like to start with this example because I used to work for GE. I worked for GE for 12 years. And it's amazing to me to contrast my memories of going through a layoff period when the economy got tough and seeing a lot of people after 60 in retirement being offered to retire early to avoid a layoff and doing math to see if their social security and their pension and their 401k balance will be enough to last them before they die, right? Number one fear of boomers, what is it? Running out of money in retirement, right? Mm -hmm. How do we have a society like that? And at the same time, the leader of that company has... Um, compensation of $18.6 million in any given year. But more importantly, if you scroll down, the second part of his compensation is an insurance product for retirement that pays $4.6 million guarantee on an annual basis starting at age 60 until he dies. Right. That, that product is worth over $70 million. This is the invisible part that 97% of the people that think this is uncommon are not seeing, right. but it's very common for the people that are in positions of making this, um, this uh, um, choices, right. right? If you keep scrolling down, this is not particular to my story or GE or a few corporations. This will be going on and on and on. Bank of America, AT&T, Boeing, Coke. I'm saying these names because what I want to take away from this is that you know what that means. When mm -hmm. I say Boeing, you already imagine, okay, that's the airplane company. But why is this CEO earning $3.18 million in guarantee income for life and retirement with when most employees will take the risk in their 401k of managing how much retirement income they receive. This is just uncommon to those that are not becoming aware and they're not seeking the financial education to use the tools that the wealthy, the banks and the corporations use. Right. And this is why we live to teach. This yeah. is why we educate. Absolutely. We'll, we always say all the time, we'll never sell you anything. We'll, we will educate you until you, you see this. And once you see this stuff, you'll never be able to unsee it ever again. Yeah. This, all this stuff is accessible to any American, yeah. but they've got to change the way they think, right? We've got to think differently and start doing what the uncommon people are doing, not what the common people are doing, yeah. which is the theme of this conversation. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's shift gears. Now, let's talk about some of the common things that we hear about whole life insurance, almost verbatim all the time. You know, if, if we're teaching a seminar, David, and we say real estate investing, people just show up. They're like, what? I've heard that's good. Let's yeah. what do we got here? Let's learn. If we say seminar on whole life insurance, red flags go up there already are like, wait a second. I'm not supposed to like this. I can't tell you why. The only thing I can tell you about whole life insurance has got a low rate of return. It's expensive to own. It's the worst investment of all time. This is pretty much like clockwork what happens across middle America. This is what they think they know about this. And this is where we, we try to drive this point home is whole life insurance is not an investment. Yeah. And if you can't get past that piece, if you still look at it from a rates of return or an investment conversation, you'll miss all the magic and all the beauty that exists inside the economic value that whole life insurance uh, provides, yeah. which is why the presidents, the giant corporations, the big banks, they love whole life insurance. Want to know why? Because they see it for what it is, a savings vehicle. It's not an investment. If you look at it as an investment, yes, you would probably say expensive to own, low rate of return, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's that why we've decided to stop teaching whole life insurance and start teaching real estate. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easier yeah. conversation because when we, but really though, when we talk to people about whole life insurance, especially the older they are, which is why we teach our kids very young yeah. about the savings environment, the older people are, 
you have to go in there and do so much unlearning for them before you can even start teaching them, yes. which is why we can never sell anything. Yeah. We will never sell you anything. We want to educate you so you start to see this. And then once you see it, you're going to go, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this 20 years ago. How many times have we heard that? Yeah. And there, there's power in this. Even, even when I identify this conversation in my conversations with clients, there's power in this because this becomes a huge why or a, a huge intersection in the road. The difference will be people that are willing to entertain a new way of thinking and they're open to all learning, relearning, or at least just observing if it's for them or not, you know? And then there's the path where it becomes an intellectual battle to see who's right and wrong. Right. And I've learned that I do not like engaging in that because staying open-minded to new ideas and new ways to look at, uh, at things is a huge sign for a person that's, uh, that has a growth mindset. 100%. Yeah. could not agree more. Now, let's look at some of the uncommon benefits that exist inside a whole life. Now, we're going to take these one by one. Uh, number one, when you start saving in this type of environment, you get to what we, sell, what we say, capture the interest cost of your dollars. Yes. So framed here, uninterrupted growth. Every dollar that flows into our policies, we capture and control it for the rest of our lives, and it earns interest for us every day for the rest of our lives. In contrast to a typical or let's say a common savings environment, like a checking your savings account, money flows through those accounts, right? And you're going to end up financing everything in life, whether you're paying money to a financial institution like a bank or you're using your own cash, the money flows through that, that account and then it's gone forever. Yeah. With the insurance policy, this is what we call a banking mindset, the money flows to your policy and as soon as it's there, it is yours forever, right? And so this uninterrupted growth, this is one of the rules of the money game people need to be paying attention to. Very few financial advisors or, or financial gurus are going to talk about this concept right here, but it has such a major effect on the longevity and size of your portfolio over a lifetime. Yeah, and I, uh, I've gotten the feedback recently that we need to be talking more and more in depth about this idea because it's hard to visualize. I, I always tell Clients, it's hard for the human mind to see uh, an exponential curve when we think linearly, right? And these are linear processes. You add, add, add to a balance in a savings account whenever you need to use it. What you don't see is that you interrupt the growth of that money. And when you send that money away, it will never earn a dollar for you in the future. The banker mindset is exactly at the definition of what banking is. It is keeping control of the money in an environment, sorry, keeping the flow of money in an environment where we have control, mm -hmm. I control that I never interrupt the compounding at the same time that I have access. How can you get the best of these two processes that most people have as common ways to flow money through their hands and make it a, a, make it a common um, sense to have the banker mindset in it? Absolutely. Yeah. And that that's a major paradigm shift. For sure. And they'll get that, that video later on in this course because yeah. what most of us have been taught is if you want to win the money game, you got to get into business or become an investor. Mm -hmm. Now, those conversations are very separate from a banking conversation. When you're also the banker for your business or your investments, now you get to have the returns in your business or an investment, plus the uninterrupted growth by owning the banking function. Absolutely. When you put those elements together, you have something truly unique, truly massive. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one, liquidity. I love talking about liquidity because it's twofold. On the one side, it offers protection. You see, the reason we keep a certain amount of liquidity in our policies at all times, so for me, we have a 30% rule. I will never borrow more than 70% of my cash values. I always leave a 30% buffer because that's my protection. That's my foundation. If something goes south, if COVID happens, something out of my control, I always have a buffer there to float me through an uncertain time. Sure. What good would it, would it do me if I spent 10 years growing this business with my blood, sweat, and tears if something came along that was uncertain that wiped me out? What, what good was all the, the past 10 years of growth without the protection there? Now, on the opposite side of that, when you have access to capital or li liquid accessible cash in your control, talk about the opportunity with that. Yeah. And, and, you know, this contrast is very profound because most of us either think one way or the other. And when you look at both of them, it becomes clear that liquidity is at the core of how you should manage your savings, not, not talking about investment, your savings. Hopefully you have that definition clear in your mind, but... 
To me, this goes back to the quote from uh, Warren Buffett. He says, be greedy when others are fearful. Mm. Take advantage of opportunity when the market doesn't seem to be playing the hand, right? A lot of people want to go and take advantage of this, the, the housing market in 2012 when the prices were low. But guess what? The only people that could take advantage of that opportunity were the people that were in a position of capital that had money available liquid to them. You know, Buffett doesn't tell us after that quote, says, comma, I'm sitting in $120 billion of cash. He doesn't say that, <laughs> one, right? But it's implied his opportunity lies on the fact that he has liquid resources to deploy when opportunity presents itself. Love it. So the opportunity is really where you get rich, but you have to have liquidity. Yeah. And the reason we love the policies is because it gives you both elements. You have the liquidity for protection, including your life, but then you also have a bigger opportunity pool that's working for you every single day in the background. So that when, not if, but when opportunity presents itself, you can jump on it. And that's how you really get rich over time. That's why having a savings strategy now, today, clear, starting today, is the best way to yeah. get, get positioned for that opportunity, right? Because you build that pool, opportunity shows up. Yep. Which is why we put it at the foundation. That part yep. is non-negotiable. Yep. No one that's going to build something uh, worthy is going to do it without liquidity. Yeah. Because you're just one disaster, one uncertain time frame away from losing everything. Yep. Now, one of the next benefits that we love, this is one of the best, is the guarantees. This is also why banks and corporations choose whole life insurance as their foundational yeah. savings environment because it's one of the only, if the only asset that has actual guarantees built into it, meaning your cash values inside these policies are guaranteed to increase every single year. Yeah. The death benefit in your policy is guaranteed to increase every single year. When properly structured, absolutely. That's why you need to work with a professional. Exactly. Not all whole life insurance is mm -hmm. built or structured the same, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you have guarantees for your premiums. So the premiums that you are paying into your policies, they can be flexible, but they are level, meaning they're never going to increase because when you buy a policy, you're essentially locked in at that premium level uh, now and every day in the future. So unlike universal life or variable or, or some other types of assets, if you've committed to that premium, it'll never change. Mm -hmm. That gives you a constant variable to rely on to bet on that in the future. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with what Kyle is talking about, the way I say this in English is, you are, the part of the obligation of the premium, right? Gets easier and easier and easier to pay every year. Fascinating. You know, part of that is inflation. You know, that amount of money today, $100,000 right. in 10 years may seem different. But how about having a vehicle, a financial vehicle that gets easier to put more premium into at the same time that is becoming more and more efficient over time. Right. To me, this speaks to the beauty of the design and the contract that is protecting you and me and a private contract uh, for that 100% probability that one of us is gonna die at some point, right? Absolutely. It's a beautiful design and it's very rare. I wanna point this out. Just do the experiment in your house. Talk to your spouse, your kids. What guarantees can you come up with in other asset classes? I would right. be very pressed to think of some. Yeah, it it honestly doesn't exist, yeah. which is why the the uncommon folks, big banks, corporations, they love this asset because this quality doesn't exist anywhere else. Yes. Actual guarantees. Yes. Now, flexible loan provision. Hmm. This to me is one of the most exciting. Yes. So what this means is as you're accumulating and saving in this new policy, this new savings environment, the cash value is building up and it's guaranteed to go up every single year. So the bigger that number gets, the bigger this guaranteed line of credit against that value is accessible to you, right? And so you have a guaranteed line of credit at any times. So that alone is so valuable. So a lot of times when we're, we're coaching this, we'll have them uh, fill out what we call our wealth scorecard how many other guaranteed lines of credit do you have? Yeah. Doesn't exist. Yes. But it does exist inside this policy. You can get access to this flexible loan provision for anything you can think of at any time frame. No credit check, no authorization. They don't ask you what it's for. Very private contract. Very um I say all the control is in your your hands, right? Yes. That that gives you so much peace of mind when playing the money game. And also when you take the line of credit, you get to have what's called an unstructured loan. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? An unstructured loan is um, 
the fact that because you're in a position of ownership of this contract, you become the loan officer. An unstructured loan means that you get to dictate how the, the loan will be amortized, how it will be repaid, right? And how it will be managed, including the purpose of the loan. How many banks can you walk into <laughs> and talk, go to the bank manager and say, hi, Mr. Bank Manager, I need $100,000 because I need to buy a new piece of equipment. Let me tell you, I don't know how business is going to go next year, so I may have to skip a few payments. Uh, and instead of five years, I'd like to amortize this for the next 40. Right. Uh, what, kind of race, uh, what kind of rate of interest could you charge me? And, and they will not be able to price that risk. One, they'd never give you that loan, yes. right? Yes. On those terms, they'd say, get out of here, you're crazy. And two, if they were, it would be a rate that's so astronomical, you'd never accept it because it'd yeah. probably have to be 25, 30, if not more for the bank to offset that risk, right? Yeah. Now, here's the contrast. Since we are saving in an uncommon environment, mm -hmm. We have access to these guaranteed lines of credits. We both have substantial cash values that have built up in our systems. So if we go to borrow money from the insurance company, current loan rates are five, a little over 5%. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. 5% completely unstructured, private. No one knows we have these. We control the amortization schedule. That amount of flexibility in the money game gives you what we call ultimate control. Yeah. Now, you don't want to abuse that flexibility, which is why we coach people on being an honest banker. But let's go back to COVID. I was just going to go there. How many people, if, if they had this type of savings environment, could have restructured their loans back to the insurance company because they have that control and yeah. said, I, we got to put this on pause because I don't know if you're seeing what's going on out there, but we have no business coming in. We have to restructure these loans right now. The banks aren't going to do that for you. Definitely not. They're, they're coming to get you when that happens, right? This is one, like, and I think we need to continue to talk about this. What does control mean to us? Because this is life, real uh, situation. This is not a theory, right? right? You bring up COVID. Restaurants have 16, day, 16 days of liquidity around the country. Mm. 16 days. If they didn't make income in 16 days, the business would shut down. Thousands of restaurants shut down around the country. I was living in California at the time. You can imagine how much worse yeah. that was with the... Uh, lack of ability to earn income because they couldn't open their businesses, right? It doesn't even take a crisis, right? Let's just think about the last couple of months with the crisis with the banks and liquidity, SBB mm -hmm. and all that, right? Banks regionally provide 70% of liquidity for small businesses around the country. If those deposits and small banks go from the larger banks because of what happened recently, guess what's going to happen to lines of credit around the country for the small farmer, the slower, small shop owner with the regional banks? If you put a third party as the controller, as the loan officer for your business, for your family liquidity, who is in control? Mm -hmm. Not you, not 100%. Right. To me, the conversation stays so shallow when we only talk about, oh, I can get this rate at the insurance company yeah. and I can get this rate at the bank. Great. You can arbitrage those two things. That's a, that's a portion of the conversation. And if that's your priority, if that's your critical variable, by all means, go get money somewhere else. But having the option to make that decision is what matters to me. Right. Because there's other things that you cannot see financially about control that matter. It would matter a lot for a lot of business owners in 2020. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the unseen value, right? Yes. Because that is a conversation we have. They say, oh, well, the loans are a little over 5% right now. Well, I can get it at this bank at 3%. Great. But that's not exactly apples to apples, right? Because this is unstructured. This is guaranteed. You control every aspect of this loan. When, when people make this connection as they start this, this is the one that they're like, oh my gosh, that is worth millions of dollars to you to have that option over your lifetime. The ability to structure these loans on your terms, that freedom and that feeling is unparalleled. You, you will never experience it unless you have this, right? Because you'll never know what that ultimate freedom and control looks and like. One last thought on this. We're going deeper in this one because obviously we're very passionate about this one. We're talking about the left side of the liquidity spectrum, right? The protection side. Right. If you need the flexibility, mm. the flexibility would be there. I look at this from the abundance side as well, from the acceleration. Yeah. I love having the opportunity to amortize a down payment on a building, a commercial building or in a rental for the same schedule of amortization that property will have to optimize my tax strategy. <laughs> or even simpler than that, just like lower. I love being the loan officer to sit down with my kids mm. 
to teach them about how this process works, right? To have the flexibility in the future that if my kid borrows money from me to buy a vehicle, to buy a rental property and something happens, I have no problem saying, yeah, let's skip two payments. Let's right. get you back in your feet. Let's learn from this experience. If I'm subject to the Four Amigos, Bank of America, Chase, City, right? Are they going to have the same kindness with my family? Are they going to have the same kindness to my I I'm ultimately putting myself in a position where I can offer opportunity to my family and my community by being in control. That's right. what controls means to me and a place where both this the protection and the acceleration spectrum of the liquidity. Uh, I love that you brought that up. And it, it goes back to the relationships, right? Yes. If you have this relationship in this environment, you get to build a relationship with your kids around lending that's that's based off of a human connection now. Yeah. Banks do not look at our children as relationships or even people. They look at them as numbers on a balance sheet. They are cash flow and nothing else to us. You think I'm wrong? Get into a pinch and see if the banks show up to help you when you've given them billions of dollars over the years, right? They don't want to really help us. They're there for one reason, and it's cash flow. So when we go back to the previous quotes we were talking about, about life insurance has a higher moral tone, it's sacred. These relationships are the most important things in life. That's what we agree on. Yeah. You have that chance as a parent, as do I, to build that relationship and bring your family circle and the financial circle together. Isn't yes. that a cool concept? Game changer when you're when you're navigating the adventure of life. And, and we're teaching your, our kids, right? That's one connection. But I'm trying to build a world where my kid can expand that message by becoming, by this being a natural way he sets relationships in the world. Our effect is probably like the butterfly effect. Mm. Teaching this one generation has unimaginable ways to plant a seed and never see a forest that will be grown right. from that. So yeah, I, I love this. And it has given me an incredible sense of confidence for my family in general. Right. So, And this is just one of the benefits, yes. right? Now, privacy. Next. Next one on this list, right? <laughs> no. The reason there's nothing on this slide is because no one needs to know about any of this. You're not telling the IRS about your policies. Not my CPA. No one unless I choose for them to have access to this information. Now, why? Going back to one of our first slides, whole life insurance is not an investment. Yes. It is a private contract between private individuals, yes. right? This is ours. It's meant to replace your human life value. It is a life insurance contract. Now, if it's structured properly and you have good coach, we're showing people how to use these. You would say this is like the world's greatest savings account. It is one of the most, if not the most private place to store money and have something that's truly yours. It's not reportable to the IRS. The loans are not reportable on any credit bureau, right? Yeah. They're completely unstructured. They're off the grid. They're not income. Right. You talk about some of these elements and people say, well, that sounds too good to be true. It exists. It's sitting right in front of you, but you just have too many preconceived notions on what whole life insurance is. Ah, it's bad. It's an investment. If people take the time to get educated, you look at this, the privacy portion of this is one of the most appealing parts of this, Right. One of the reasons why banks love it, corporations, because did they have to report on that? And guess what? It represents some of their most pristine capital, their most pristine reserves. It's measured against their riskiest assets. And yet, try to go and find information other than going to the FDIC and getting a big balance. Right. If you try to find details into it, it's very, very difficult to find details about these private contracts. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, passive income stream. One of the reasons why banks love this is it provides them an improvement to their income statement. Now, you all are going to are going to see this on my personal example after this video. Mm -hmm. Because the policies are guaranteed to increase every single year, one of the things that that we've developed because we love to innovate here, it's one of our core values, yeah. is we took an annual illustration and we changed it to monthly growth. And that's what makes sense to Americans because we think in monthly timeframes. We don't think in annual timeframes. And if you look at the monthly cash growth inside the cash value growth in an insurance policy, it's going up every single month. Now, our cash value increases on a monthly basis are pretty substantial. Yeah. But is any of that reportable to anyone? No. No. Do we have access to use that growth for whatever we want? The business, an investment, a vacation? Every month, whether I sleep or not. Absolutely. So yep. it's this is a savings environment that actually produces passive income for you. Isn't that something? 
Would your Incredible. checking account or savings account ever do that? How hard did you work for it, Kyle? Did you sweat, bled? How are you calling the insurance company every day, making sure that they're putting a little more into that balance? How 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 much time is this taking? How loud is it in your life? Right, it is a what we call a silent asset. Yeah. It's funded in a contract with a company that's been around over a hundred years, phenomenal track record. You see, the reasons banks and corporations love insurance companies is because it's one of the safest, if not the safest place for them to store money. No one else has that track record of success, which is why the banks don't hold their own reserves. They mm -hmm. choose very intentionally insurance companies to hold their cash reserves because they know they're, they're one better. They know their banks. They don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. So the, the current passive income stream for these policies is so powerful. And not only right now, but since the policies are guaranteed to grow every year, what happens to us in the later stages of life? What will that passive income stream look like in, let's say, a retirement stage? It becomes larger and larger, and it will be a way to supplement whatever strategy you have today. It's a way to make it better. Right. It's a way to not affect your professional income and tax your Social Security, for example. It's a way to have access to liquidity to create more cash flow in the future. You know, For us, I love creating cash flow because it becomes a more efficient process year after year. This is a way to implement a solution for getting money to work more efficiently for you in the future. And I would say in this conversation here, you have to go a couple of levels deeper. You need to have a conversation with money where the relationship is more intimate. That's why I love when you talk about timeframes, right? Most of us may have a notional idea of our annual income, but really our relationship with money happens on a weekly, monthly basis, right? We're, we're used to understanding our expenses, uh, you know, if you're an employee, your paycheck, right? We cannot put all their things financially, like looking at our financial statement once a year or every three years, or just talking to our CPA once a year, when our relationship is in a different time frame. And when we start looking at these vehicles, at this environment, on that relationship scale, monthly basis, it is so clear to me that for the amount of growth I see on my income statement from my policies, if I were to look at an investment, I would have to deploy so much more yeah. capital and take so much more risk that I've decided that I'm going to build the biggest foundation I can on whole life to later take opportunity with my liquidity of other things. I love it. Yeah. Could not agree more. Now, there's also a tax-free transfer of wealth. And this, mm -hmm. is, this is one that's probably more well-known because I know it's life insurance. Right. And so if you pass away, you know, there's going to be a death benefit. Um, that's transferring to your beneficiaries. Now, one of the reasons that we also love this asset and going back to like the early founding fathers, they knew the economic value of this asset class is it's no, it's no um, mystery that our country is in a ton of debt. Yeah. That means our children are being born into a perpetual debt cycle because we can't change our money habits across middle America, which is why we're on the mission that we're on. Yeah. And so if our kids are born into a perpetual debt cycle, how are we going to fix that? Will it ever be a top-down approach? I think you and I would agree. It's most likely not going to happen that, that way. That would not be the intentional approach we choose. Right. But we are taking that control and that stewardship into our own families. So the death benefits that we each have, if you look at how much insurance, uh, death benefit in the insurance industry, you know, it's, it's pretty similar. Now, if you look at our unique scenarios, the amount of death benefit we're carrying on our families will wipe out any debt, probably times 10 minimum yeah. for us, yeah. which means there is a tax-free transfer of wealth to the next generation. Now you referenced it earlier, and to me, this is part of the higher moral tone of insurance. The way we are living and who you and I have decided to become is individuals who will plant a seed, and it's that proverb, knowing we'll never sit under the shade of that tree. Yes. Now, we are going to do phenomenal things uh, from a wealth perspective in our lifetimes. But our kids, generation two, are going to inherit something so big, so private, so tax-free, that it'll literally set them up not only for their generation, but another generation. Now, we have our policies multiple generations, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that uh, level of stewardship in that conversation, if we had more Americans doing this across the board just with insurance, the tax-free transfer of wealth and the impact that we'd have, this would probably take you know 50 to 100 years to really implement. We're willing to commit our lives to that so that going forward, our kids are born into a way different conversation than most other families. Yeah, uh, I, this is the tale of two paths, right? 
Do you want to be part of the left side and then go on a perpetual cycle of debt like you're talking about? Or do you want to go on the path of American values, self-reliance, protecting each other on, uh, on a private contract, capitalist ideas where we create value for the next generation because it's our duty, it's our moral tone to set people to more prosperity in the future by you know being good stewards. And the part that's hidden in this slide that is not shown is this represents 90 to 97% of the population engage in that system. And the 3% that see this as a common path are the ones building that 28 trillion. Yeah. What would happen if we just move a small percentage of the population from left to right to go in the right path, which is the mission we're in, right? Yeah. It would change radically the path for the next generation to see the right values, the right ideas. And this makes me think of the pyramid because the other part about generational wealth that we don't talk about is, is not setting the kids up with money is setting the kids up to be the next generation stewards mm -hmm. to, to, to manage and then create more blessings for the next generation. So when I think about the pyramid, my kids will not be sitting at the top of the pyramid. My kids will enter that pyramid from the bottom, the right education, the right awareness, a constant relationship with money, building the right habits and building from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the reality is the kids, they have to build that foundation the same way we are. So we as parents have got to take that education and that relationship into our own hands. Yes. We cannot rely on other people to teach our kids about money. Yes. It, it's not happening. And it's one of the reasons why we're in this predicament we are today, right? So we, we understand that. And so, the, yeah, the benefit of tax-free transfer of wealth is such a powerful, now we're talking about big ideas, oh, yeah. right? This is why our community is so important to other people that are willing to hear this message. And so going back to that, that quote from Theodore Roosevelt, life insurance increases the stability of the business world, raises its moral tone, and puts a premium upon those habits of thrift and saving, which are essential to the welfare of the people as a body. Exactly what you just said about your boys, right? More applicable, more applicable than ever in history. Right? Mm -hmm. We need to remember what the wise men in our nation were telling us to follow as an example of success. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the last benefit is a high savings rate. Mm -hmm. Now, banks, corporations, they would argue that whole life insurance gives them a very high non-correlated return. Yeah. Non-correlated, meaning not attached to the stock market. Isn't that interesting that banks would say whole life has a high savings rate when middle America or common folk are saying it's got a low rate of return? So make sure you watch the very next video in this series because we're going to do a deep dive on why we think and know that whole life insurance has the highest savings rate from a savings environment. Absolutely.